When I was 14, I had the rare opportunity to travel to Vietnam with my father. It was 1991, pre-embargo being lifted, and the country was frozen in time at a point some 30 years earlier when the last helicopter had just left the embassy's roof in Saigon. I had seen poverty and poor health in this country, but nothing prepared me for what I saw on that trip to Vietnam. The intensity of the poverty was indescribable. And as a 14-year-old, it was incredibly hard to understand how such a situation could exist. Much of the population lived in rural areas with little access to decent housing, to transportation, to hospitals. Electricity and running water were scarce. I saw health clinics that were just concrete frames with nothing more than thin wisps of cloth as doors. I was that nerdy kid who knew I wanted to be a doctor. But what I learned on that trip was that I wanted to do global health. And the experience made me realize that there was much to learn. So I went on and I got a medical degree. I got my master's in public health. And I now spend my career, my combined career, at the Mass General Hospital. And today, as a 36-year-old, I've actually, today, it is still hard to understand how such a situation can exist. It turns out I have never been able to reconcile what I saw on that trip as a 14-year-old. Only now, today, those images from Vietnam are compounded by more, from Tanzania, Rwanda, Ghana, Uganda, Kenya, Bangladesh. Throughout my training, I had the opportunity to meet others who shared the same concern that I did about the challenges to global health and to really to the world's poverty. And we found ourselves asking, what can we do about this? How can we help improve global health in a sustainable, country-owned and better way? We think we actually may have part of an answer. And it is not by a more better drugs, it's not by building more or bigger hospitals. It's not by investing more in disease-specific causes or by sending doctors and nurses abroad for the short term to just put a Band-Aid on the problem. But before we talk about the answer, we need to understand the problem. To put it in context, in the United States, maternal mortality is 21 of every 100,000 births. In Africa, 500 women will die for every 100,000 births. In the U.S., one in every 125 children will die before the age of five. In Africa, one in every nine will die before the age of five. In Africa, malaria is still a leading killer, and HIV, 75 percent of the world's HIV burden is still concentrated there. There is a critical shortage of 2.4 million doctors and nurses collectively in over 57 countries. And what that means for a country like Tanzania is that there are only 24 nurses and one doctor for every 100,000 people. To put that in context, in the U.S., there's 980 nurses and 240 doctors for the same 100,000 people. Africa actually is 24 percent of the world's burden of disease, and only 3% of the healthcare workforce, the world's healthcare workforce, with which to tackle it. And it gets worse. Turns out the doctors and nurses are leaving their home health systems because of lack of job opportunity, lack of professional development opportunity, lack of mentorship. And that means that skilled health professionals are leaving in what we call brain drain. That one doctor and 24 nurses in Tanzania are leaving under-resourced areas and under-resourced countries, places with deep health needs for places with less acute needs but better opportunity. And the most significant repercussion of this is that there aren't enough doctors and nurses to train new doctors and nurses. So faculty shortages are endemic and students are going untrained. In Ethiopia, they've actually doubled the number of medical schools and they've doubled the number of medical students but they're not able to double the number of faculty. And this is happening all over the continent. A colleague of mine was shocked when he went to Mali and he saw a classroom of 2,000 students in over 100-degree heat. 
all clamoring to learn. The professor was completely inaudible. The writing on the blackboard was completely invisible. And yet they all stayed craning to get every last drop of education. The result is that a cycle of depleted and inadequate health care is perpetuated, and that means that people are dying of treatable illnesses every day. As a physician, I've seen this in the places I've worked, in Ghana, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Bangladesh. People don't go to the hospital unless they're very sick, or they simply don't go at all. They have little faith that anybody can help them. Hospitals are where you go to die. The bottom line is that people are at the heart of a health system. So what can we do about this? How can we ensure that there are enough doctors and nurses walking the wards able to both care for patients, but also to train their successors? It turns out that in this country, there's a number of health professionals who are eager to participate, who want to do something about this, but they don't actually have the structured opportunity or support to be able to do so. And just sending them abroad for short-term stints to be able to provide care is simply putting a plug in the dam. It's not actually fixing the underlying structural problem. So we realized, what if we could fix both problems and take those who are eager to serve and want to serve and have the energy and desire to serve, and we send them as faculty to the places in need to teach and train and to create a new generation of doctors and nurses. So we collaborated with the Peace Corps, and we started a nonprofit called Seed Global Health. It actually all started in October 2010, when a colleague of mine told me about an event that was happening here in Boston with the former Peace Corps, three former Peace Corps directors and then current director. And I did something I've never done before. I went and I asked an anonymous question. Albeit, it was completely nervous, but it was anonymous. <laughs> and I raised my hand and I just asked, what do you think about sending doctors and nurses as part of the Peace Corps as educators, teachers and trainers? And the answer was yes. I actually still joke with the, he was, he was, was the then former director, so he's, he's now the former director, but he was the then current director, and I still tease him, he's on our board now, and I still tease him because he paused before he said yes, <laughs> because he knew if he said yes, he was going to open a door. But he did say yes, and that door did open. And today we have the first federal program for international medical and nursing service. We realized, though, to get this started, to be able to do this, we needed to help eliminate another major barrier. We couldn't just put people in the field with technical support and logistical support. We had to actually take away a barrier to enable people to serve, and that's debt. So Seed Global Health provides stipends to the volunteers to help them pay back their educational loans, their mortgages, and other forms of financial debt that would keep them from participating. This year, we're going to help 27 volunteers, and we're going to help eliminate close to $700,000 worth of debt. Here's how it works. We send volunteers in one-year posts as faculty to places like Tanzania and Malawi. And there, they will teach, train, and transfer skills to build a, new, to build a pipeline of new doctors and nurses and new health professionals. But the critical difference in our mission from other efforts is that we focus on education and capacity building. So that by training one OBGYN, we empower that OBGYN to train across the health spectrum. They can train a community health worker who can assist in pregnancy and recognize labor. They can train a midwife who can assist through labor and recognize distress. Or they can train another OBGYN who can not only deal with preterm birth and hemorrhage, but could train another community health worker, another midwife, another OBGYN, and so on. By focusing on health leadership, we're not only just answering the call of our partner countries for more technical capacity, but we're actually making investment in sustainable and independent health systems. We work closely with the Peace Corps and ministries of health and ministries of higher education to better understand the educational needs of each country. We then work with local institutions, hospitals, nursing schools, and medical schools to identify the exact specialties that are needed at each of these sites. And in a dorkier medical version of online dating, we match the site requests 
for a cardiologist, an anesthesiologist, a pediatrician, with those applicants who are best suited to serve at that site. I'm really proud to share with you that in a few short weeks, we're going to be sending 31 doctors and nurses to Tanzania, Malawi, and Uganda. We're struck, though, by the diversity and stories of our volunteers. Some are recent graduates, others have been practicing for 30 years. For some, this is the beginning of their career. For others, it's a culmination. Some are going to be serving with their spouses, some are just going to leave them behind. <laughs> but they come from all over the United States, and they come from a myriad of specialties, including psychiatry, anesthesia, pediatrics, family medicine. Meet Natalie Sloan. Natalie was in the Peace Corps from 2007 to 2009. She served as a health educator working with community health workers in Mauritania, West Africa. After Natalie left the Peace Corps, she actually decided to go to nursing school. And she's built a career as a nurse, an educator, and a researcher working with at-risk populations, including the homeless and veterans. Natalie is now going to give up her job in Seattle with all of its resources and all of its opportunity. She's going to rejoin the Peace Corps and work in rural Uganda. She will serve as faculty at the Lyra College of Nursing, which is located in northern Uganda, an area which until recently was besieged by conflict. The region is now rebuilding, but Lyra would not have been able to open its doors without Natalie and one of her Steve Global Health colleagues. Instead, this August, Lyra is going to welcome its first class of nursing students, and the college has become a symbol of hope and rebuilding for the region. Meet Johnstone Kumwenda. Dr. Kumwenda is the dean of the Malawi College of Medicine and one of our chief collaborators. Dr. Kumwenda was actually taught by Peace Corps volunteers in the sciences in his youth. And he's gone on to have an internationally recognized medical education career. Dr. Johnstone understands firsthand the challenges that his country and his university face. And he knows exactly how his university could amplify the numbers of doctors and nurses for his country. But anticipating the Seed Global Health and Peace Corps volunteers, Dr. Johnstone believes that just six doctors and six nurses will not only have an immediate impact for his country, but will have an exponential effect on generations of Malawian doctors and nurses. Because one doctor will train 10 doctors, who will each go on to train 10 more, and so on. Seed Global Health will have a growing impact as we expand countries and include more health professions. We look forward to meeting nurses in Peru who were taught by our volunteers and have become the deans of their nursing school. We hope to meet doctors in Burma who were taught by our volunteers and are now helping to shape their country's health system. We believe that with the collective vision and energy of many like you, we can help develop the health education leadership that will shape a country's future doctors and nurses. We can train outstanding teachers so that they and the ones that they train won't leave, but will stay in their communities and help tackle the world's greatest health problems. In 1960, President Kennedy stood on the steps of the University of Michigan. He was actually then candidate Kennedy. And he asked, how many of you who are going to be doctors are willing to spend your days in Ghana? Those words were the seeds for the Peace Corps, which he created in one of his first acts in office. Next month, we know who 32 of those individuals will be, doctors and nurses who are willing to spend their days in Tanzania, in Malawi, in Uganda, teaching and training, and cultivating a new generation of health leadership. Thank you.